Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, our speaker today, Ryan Ballot. Ryan Ballot is a candidate for the Benson Center Endowed Chair, as you know. Um, he got a his bachelor's degree from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, the summa cum laude. He won a Rhodes Scholarship and earned a first class degree from Oxford, Corpus Christi. He got his PhD in classics from Princeton. Ryan has devoted his intellectual life to the tradition of Western political thought and has been extremely influential among scholars and intellectuals concerned with ancient political theory and some of its later ramifications. His intellectual leadership and influence is implicit in projects such as his magisterial edited volumes from top presses like Princeton, Blackwell, and Oxford on central issues in ancient history and thought. I happen to have both his Thucydides and Greek and Roman political thought on my shelves. And I think not only if you felt the heft of this, but if you read it, you would realize just how substantial and influential these works are. Um, his original works, his monographs, include a synthetic book entitled Greek Political Thought, published at Oxford by Blackwell in 2006, which has been called the best comprehensive single author treatment of the subject in two generations. And the monograph will appear in Chinese. Um, and I'm not sure if I can, I tried to come up with a joke about intellectual property or theft, but I, I couldn't think of a good one. <laughs> um, his more focused books are on Greed and Injustice in Classical Athens, which came out from Princeton 2001, and Courage in the Democratic Polis, Ideology and Critique in Classical Athens from Oxford in 2014. Um, now, on the one hand, one might think that whereas many people stray from the path of virtue, um, he is on a much better trajectory, right? Starting out with greed and injustice and moving up to courage. But more seriously, um, what has always most impressed me about Ryan's work is his immense erudition, his subtle and precise reasoning, and a sensitivity to historical and political context that few professional historians can match. And despite his nuanced and contextual treatments, it remains clear throughout his work that the basic issues he analyzes in ancient Athens remain timely, one might even say urgent, today. Now, my high, happy to say my high opinion of his work is widely shared, and this is shown, for instance, by multitude of prestigious fellowships, invited and endowed lectures, and visiting appointments. Many of these are international, um, so he not only gets, of course, the United Kingdom, France, and Germany, but Norway, Korea, and Norway, Greece, and Korea. Now, in addition to these three major collections, I only have two, um, and his three books, he has also written something like 36 articles and chapters and 25 book reviews. And if you look at the topics he'll, he treats, you'll realize how broad is his knowledge and how wide his curiosity. Publications range from Foucault to Virgil's Georgics, classical Athenian democracy to Aristotle and Plato, from Thucydides and Polybius to later thinkers such as Augustine, Machiavelli, and de Tocqueville. And finally, the relationship between democracy and moral systems and categories, in particular, the vices and virtues. Today, he will speak on the last of these topics on the virtues of democratic citizenship, ancient and modern. Please join me in welcoming Ryan Ballard. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for that generous introduction. Um, and thank you to my hosts. Thank you for being here today. Um, I should probably get right down to business. Um, so most observers would agree that democracies across the globe are under threat. Freedom Houses, Freedom in the World Report of 2019 bears the somber title, Democracy in Retreat. This report documents the breakdown of free and fair elections, the assaults on term limits for executives, increasing suppression of civil society, attacks on the media, 
and so on. One can find evidence of these phenomena everywhere across the globe. For example, Myanmar's imprisoning of journalists, China's digital surveillance, Viktor Orban's closure of the Central European University. In the United States, democracy's retreat has taken a particular form involving attacks on the legitimacy of public institutions and governmental authorities. So much so that in 2018, Chief Justice John Roberts issued a rare statement rebuking the president <coughs> for his derogatory remarks on Obama judges, comments that Roberts interpreted as an attack on the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary. Public controversies of this sort, the Chief Justice and the President of the United States, are especially significant because America, of course, has the status of being the world's oldest functioning democracy, as well as because of America's traditional global democratic leadership. Even more salient, perhaps, is the erosion of citizens' trust in one another and the consequent atmosphere of intense polarization. In the absence of trust among citizens, public conversation and discourse have become brittle and fragmented, and at times even rancorous, a development that poses obstacles to the success of democratic self-government. Even though I now live in Toronto, in Canada, I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, and as an American, I've been disturbed by our country's ever-increasing fragmentation. And that's why today I want to talk about the cultivation of trust among citizens of democracies and about the virtues necessary to maintaining it. For reasons that I'll explain, I believe that a social ethos of trust and the citizen's possession of courage are essential to democratic flourishing. Courage, I'll suggest, should take a special form in democracy, that of supporting the trust that enables citizens to deliberate effectively with one another. I propose to take a long historical perspective on these questions. I'll focus above all on the first democracy of ancient Athens, and then move briefly at the end to 19th century America in the writings of Alexis de Tocqueville. My goal is to shed light on our contemporary predicament by exploring democratic history and theory. Examining democratic history will give us critical distance on our own controversies. It will also, I think, enrich our political vocabularies and give us sharper analytical tools. I don't pretend to legislate or to propose solutions on that basis, however, as though the theoretical and historical inquiry might displace the difficult tasks of citizenship, uh, of, of citizenship or statesmanship. But I do believe that better practice and richer conversations are necessarily based on a deeper theoretical understanding. Today, almost half of Americans find it stressful and frustrating to discuss politics uh, with people outside their inner circles. We're all familiar with our country's increasingly extreme partisanship, um, which I say is based on primarily on a refusal to entertain others' perspectives. Radical partisanship threatens to undermine our democracy because democratic decision-making is founded on the principle of shared deliberation among citizens and their representatives with a view to achieving a common good. The Pew Research Center has found that only 25% of Americans believe that the tone of debate 
among political leaders is respectful. While most Democrats and Republicans believe that members of their own party experience unfair constraints on speech. Members of the opposing party, however, <coughs> enjoy great freewheeling freedom. Now those findings, I would say, among others, speak to a pervasive distrust among American citizens and to the lack of a common ethical culture which alone can sustain the democratic political process. By way of contrast, the ancient Athenian democracy provides a richly documented and philosophically interesting example of a high functioning democratic culture. While the Athenians' exclusions of people they considered outsiders to the citizen body, immigrants, for example, women, slaves, these exclusions constitute significant limitations. But nonetheless, their discourses and practices will spark illuminating questions for us. So I want first to explore the character <coughs> of public debate in Athens. And then I will draw out the civic virtues that made public debates a genuinely transformative experience. So democracy in ancient Athens, and I'm talking about the period from roughly 508 BC to 322 BC, meant literally the power of the people, the kratos of the demos. Athens was a direct democracy in which all citizens, rich and poor, ruled themselves through participating in the citizens' assembly, the council, the law courts, and other public institutions. As members of a participatory citizenry, the Athenians took responsibility, one and all, for their shared fate. Their emphasis on direct per political participation implied the need for strong bonds of social trust <coughs> among citizens, particularly when it came to public debates on political questions. As much as they prided themselves on the city's accomplishments in war and peace, for example, in their political activities, the Athenians proceeded to act only after a carefully reasoned consideration of alternatives. In other words, they always understood that action had to be meaningfully directed, explained, and justified by speech. In the course of their long history of public debates, the Athenians developed a practical grasp of how best to learn through conversation with their fellow citizens. Their central idea was that democracy has a distinctive capacity to harness the intelligence of diverse citizens. It did so through encouraging a wide range of citizens to develop novel ideas and to express dissent freely. It also demanded that citizens be willing to listen to others and to revise their views uh, depending on or in accordance with the outcomes of public conversations. The Athenians' vocabulary of free speech pinpointed the salient elements of their public debates and their understanding of citizen learning. First, they cherished what they called parousia, a Greek word that literally means saying everything. It's often translated as free speech or even better as frank speech in order to capture the overtones of its outspokenness. They emphasized, in other words, audacity in the expression of new ideas and even challenges to convention. The fourth century BC Athenian statesman Demosthenes observed with pride that at Athens one could speak freely and praise 
whatever law, laws one liked. One could criticize publicly democratic laws and praise the oligarchic laws of Sparta, for example. Whereas in undemocratic Sparta, one couldn't praise the laws of Athens or any other city, only the Spartan laws. So democracy enabled the possibility even of a fundamental critique even of itself. Democracies enjoy and benefit from a distinctive culture of free and open speech, which contrasts sharply with the censored speech of non-democratic regimes, a point that resonates now as much as it did in ancient Greece. Perhaps the very novelty of new ideas would strike some as offensive or questionable. The Athenians' democratic ethos, however, encouraged them to believe, as people sometimes say, that <coughs> to disagree is not to be disagreeable. Or, perhaps, to make that point a little bit more nuanced, the Athenians held that even if fundamental disagreements were disagreeable at a certain level, nonetheless, their citizens' frank speech could still provide opportunities to learn something important. At the same time, and this is the second point about their vocabulary, they also embraced what they called equality of speech, isegoria in Greek. Every citizen from whichever walk of life, whichever socioeconomic status, was equally entitled to address his fellow citizens, and in particular to correct those who spoke their minds freely, including members of the elite. Diversity in deliberation became effective only when free or outspoken speech was balanced by equality in speech. Question for us. What enabled the Athenians' public disagreements to become genuinely transformative experiences? In other words, why were their disagreements more than merely verbal salvos that served to entrench pre-existing ideological polarities. Why did public discourse have a transformative impact? Well, <coughs> naturally, the Athenians' public institutions per se were critical to the success of their democratic discourse. And I think that scholars have traditionally looked to those institutions like the assembly, the council, the law courts, and others um, in order to explain their democratic success. But I would say that institutions function successfully only when the citizen body works the machine in reliable, disciplined, and prudent ways. Only when citizens act together, particularly, for good reasons that they themselves understand. That's why I'd answer my own questions by referring to the political virtues of the ancient Athenian democracy, specifically to the Athenians' democratic ethos of trust, which was supported by a specific ideal of democratic courage. In ancient Athenian political thought, trust was a central characteristic of civic friendship. Trust embodies confidence in the reliability of others, despite their freedom, despite the uncertainties of the future and the limits of our knowledge, and in particular cases, despite others' power over us, for example, in the case of magistrates, ordinary citizens. Now, the word despite appeared in that sentence many times for a particular reason. At the center of trust are vulnerability and loss of certainty or control, not knowledge of others' predictability, but rather a self-conscious acceptance of others' unpredictability, combined even if paradoxically, 
with a confident willingness to rely on them in speech and action. Trust implies a surrender of our own control with a view to making possible novel forms of agency, including collective agency on a large political scale. And that sense of vulnerability helps to explain why trust is dependent on courage. The Athenians themselves were familiar with the insidious power of distrust. Thucydides, the historian of the great war between Athens and Sparta in the late 5th century BC, presents the Athenian speaker Diodotus as criticizing the corruption of free speech at Athens <coughs> in the following words. Quote, it's become the rule also to treat good advice honestly given as being no less under suspicion than bad, so that a man who has something rather good to say must tell lies in order to be believed, just as a man who gives terrible advice must win the people over by deception." End quote. Now, Diodotus brought to light a certain species of political corruption that prevented citizens from communicating transparently with one another. He was offering the Athenian people a criticism of themselves. And I think it's important that central to the democratic experience of Athens is the notion of self-criticism. Um, intriguingly, Diodotus addressed his audience by means of a functioning institution, the Athenian Assembly, but he showed and argued that the healthy functioning of that institution depended on the character of the citizens and their relationships with one another. That was his theory. But notice, too, that Diodotus himself, in making this speech, exemplifies civic courage because he had the audacity to provide his fellow citizens with meaningful criticism when flattery might have promoted his career more straightforwardly. And it's that latter point that I now want to look at a little bit more closely. So Athenian style deliberation required courage in two ways. First of all, in enabling speakers to think and speak independently, overcoming any residual fear of humiliation or even prosecution at the limit. And second, in enabling both speakers and audiences to listen openly and to revise their views whenever necessary in light of justified criticism. Now, I want to explore the Athenians' development of civic courage, which helped them to maintain political trust. Because courage was, civic courage, was the very virtue designed to address the vulnerabilities associated with trust. Of course, the Athenians' cultivation of democratic virtues, such as civic courage, could never be foolproof because we can't ever be entirely sure that others are honest or sincere. On the other hand, given a history of success in both speech and action, it was plausible for the Athenians to believe that nurturing the virtues of citizenship was an essential feature of their efforts to foster a vibrant culture of productive public discourse. So contributing to public debate entailed risks. Speakers could be shouted down. They could be informally harassed for their views. Or worst of all, they could be charged with making an illegal proposal. As a result, speakers would have been tempted to channel the short-term desires of the demos or people in order to win adulation and respect. In one important speech, Demosthenes, again, the Athenian statesman, told the audience, and I quote, 
the speakers never make you either bad or good, but you make them whichever you choose. For it's not you that aim at what they wish for, but they who aim at whatever they think you desire. In other words, it would have been easy to tell a Democratic audience what they wanted to hear and to avoid making bold resolutions that challenged their assumptions. But civic courage required independence of thought, along with a willingness to take risks in public speech. And so we can see in a related speech that Demosthenes worked on a positive conception or formulation of civic courage. He imagined a rival charging him with declining to run risks or make, make a risky proposal, let's say, which allegedly shows that he's a, a weak coward. And in the course of defending himself, Demosthenes formulates civic courage as the ability to speak freely even against the people's inclinations. Quote, whoever often opposes your wishes for the sake of what is best and never speaks to win favor, but to promote your best interests, that man is truly courageous. He's the useful citizen, end quote. Genuinely courageous citizens, in other words, resist the urge to parrot back to the people exactly what they want to hear. While civic courage enabled individuals to speak their minds, the Athenians also stressed that fellow citizens should and could listen to and learn from one another. They had to take <coughs> criticism in the right spirit. They had to, not to repudiate dissent, but rather to foster it. But it took courage to recognize and admit error and to revise one's views. And in one expression of this idea, Demosthenes again says, quote, as I see it, men of Athens, no one with sense would reject the idea that it's best of all for the city to do nothing disadvantageous at the beginning. But if that doesn't happen, no one would deny the value of having those who will immediately object present." End quote. In order to avoid the pernicious distrust emphasized by Diodotus, the Athenians fostered an ideal of courageously speaking the truth to one's fellow citizens and a reciprocal ideal that demanded that citizens have the courage to listen openly to criticism. That ideal of courage was a shared reference point for Athenian citizens that I'll now argue helped them to develop the ethos of social trust that was characteristic of civic friendship. So Thucydides, again, helps us to understand why shared ethical reference points are central to the cultivation of civic trust. Thucydides presented himself as a social pathologist, a diagnostician of politics gone awry. He provided an impressive analysis of the erosion of trust in the civil war at Corsaira, a city in Western Greece. So impressive, in fact, that his analysis became the template for the state of nature in Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. Thucydides reported that the city of Corsaira was divided into two sides that viewed each other with distrust. Political groups were united by their shared lawlessness and opportunism. He says, enjoying their victories all the more if they could win them by taking advantage of the other side. In other words, those who may have trusted them. Criminality, taking advantage unjustly, in fact, often takes advantage of the vulnerabilities um, that are at the core of social trust. Well, for us, the relevant idea is that the citizens of Corsaira destroyed their ethical reference points. 
They destroyed the shared ideals and understandings that had once made it possible for fellow citizens to imagine going on into the future together. So to emphasize that point, Thucydides described certain wide-ranging transformations in the Corsairean's ethical and political vocabulary. This is a quotation from Thucydides in his own voice. He says, ill-considered boldness was counted as the courage of a loyal ally. Prudent hesitation was considered to be cowardice in disguise. Moderation was held to be a cloak for timidity. A mind that could grasp the good of the whole was considered wholly lazy. Sudden fury was accepted as the central element of courage. Plotting for one's own security was considered a justifiable means of self-defense. The advocates of extreme, measure, of extreme measures were always trustworthy. Their opponents were to be suspected." End quote. That destructive revaluation of prudence, courage, and moderation was both a symptom of distrust and a fundamental obstacle to its renewal. Arguably, at least, the Athenians were less vulnerable to that devastating turmoil because of their culture of free speech, their self-criticism, and their shared ethical ideals. They had enjoyed a long history of successful and cooperative action based on those ideals and shared reference points. It's reasonable to wonder how civic courage became a shared reference point among classical Athenians. In pursuing an answer to that question, we can appreciate the interconnections between political theory and democratic history. <coughs> In the 20th and 21st centuries, democracy has become synonymous with political legitimacy. Even autocrats pay tribute to democracy, holding elections that mimic genuinely democratic practices. In classical Greece, by contrast, democracy was not accepted unreflectively. On the contrary, as a newer political form <coughs> that repudiated traditional hierarchies, its approach to public decision making was highly questionable. As a result, its exponents had to build a case for it carefully. They had to show, in particular, how it was still able to cultivate virtues such as courage or prudence despite subscribing to equality rather than hierarchy. In the heroic and aristocratic world of ancient Greece, Courage was the paramount virtue of aggressive and violent men, and it was displayed chiefly in deadly confrontations on the battlefield. Later, when the Athenians had developed their democracy, they still prized military courage, of course, but they began to subordinate bravery in battle to the intellectual virtues of the Athenian assembly. They transformed the quality of military courage, in other words, by envisioning it as an outgrowth of specifically democratic deliberation. The clearest statement of that transformation comes from one of the most famous pieces of classical literature, um, altogether the funeral oration of Pericles in as represented in Thucydides' history. And this is what the Athenian statesman said, and I quote, we do not think that words are harmful to deeds. Instead, it's harmful not to be instructed in advance by argument before going indeed to what is necessary. For we differ 
from others, like the Spartans, in this respect, that we ourselves, the same men, both dare the most and calculate about what we undertake. <coughs> we undertake. Whereas for others, ignorance brings boldness and calculation, hesitation. And here's the key sentence. Those would rightly be judged most courageous who know most clearly pains and pleasures and nevertheless do not turn away from danger. End quote. In democracies, as opposed to oligarchies or tyrannies, Pericles is saying, citizens deliberate openly amongst themselves in order to discern the best course of action. Everyone's voice should be heard. In the collective multitude of citizenry can be found through discussion a wisdom or prudence to guide action. In non-democratic regimes, free speech was strictly circumscribed. Non-democrats might even believe that careful deliberation hinders courageous action by creating anxiety and undermining boldness. They might also believe that courage is best motivated by the fear of shame or by social pressures. <coughs> but their reasoning is faulty. Genuine courage cannot be motivated by social pressure or fear because courage consists in a clear-sighted grasp of the significance of a cause and the capacity to act effe effectively on the basis of that understanding. Pericles showed that as a democratic virtue, courage had to be well informed by, at the very least, intellectual clarity, which itself originated in free and open discussions among democratic citizens. The Athenian democracy transformed courage by linking it to free speech and equality. As soon as political debates and rational speech were seen to have authority over military courage, it made sense for the Athenians to admire the courage to speak frankly to others, to engage in self-criticism, and to modify their views whenever necessary. In other words, civic courage thereby gained legitimacy as the, virtual, as the virtue essential to democratic deliberation. The Athenians embraced a particular public understanding of this virtue, seeing it as central to the functioning of their institutions. Their public understanding of courage and other virtues fostered social trust by providing a shared background of ethical ideals by contrast with disintegrating cities such as Thucydides, Corsaira. Intriguingly, although this defense of democracy and its virtues was first developed in a distant ancient society, it's proved attractive to modern exponents of democracy too. Reflections of these ideas can be found as a result in the analysis of the American democracy found in Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, the two-volume work written in the 1830s and based on the North American travels of Tocqueville, Alexis de Tocqueville, a young French aristocrat. Tocqueville's analysis illustrates the persistence across time of salient elements of the democratic ethos that are traceable to classical Athens. And I want to turn to his work just briefly in order to highlight the ways in which certain essential features of democratic thinking are still from the past, are still relevant to us today, even though we live in a much larger state, a much more diverse state, and with much more powerful means of communication and technology. So consider, for example, Tocqueville's presentation of the Americans' development of a newly democratic model of courage. 
he argues that the democratic regime engages in a form of soul craft that shapes the military experience of democratic soldiers, calling democratic courage intelligent. He argues that its source is, and I quote, the very will of the one who obeys. It's supported not only by his instinct, but also by his reason, end quote. Oh, sorry. <coughs> yeah, end quote. The serf who populates aristocratic armies, he says, quote, acts without thinking. That democratic transformation of courage is remarkably similar to the one <coughs> described by Pericles. More importantly, as in classical Athens, the transformation of military courage gave rise to ideals of social, moral, and political courage in diverse areas of American life. For example, Tocqueville praised American women for tough-mindedness, courage, and intellectual clarity in their lives on the frontier. He also admired America's democratic institutions for teaching citizens to take responsibility for their own actions and to take initiative in asserting their rights and realizing their opportunities, all of which he considered manifestations of a civically courageous disposition. And that disposition in his presentation was a direct outgrowth of the Americans' democratic experience. Now, Tocqueville's presentation of civic courage is closely connected to his reflections on social trust as a central facet of democratic flourishing. One of the keys to the success of American democracy was its emphasis on self-government by the citizens themselves, including local self-rule and the civic friendships it fostered. In his understanding, the American founders thought that, quote, it was fitting to give political life to each portion of the territory in order to multiply infinitely the occasions for citizens to act together and to make them feel every day that they depend on one another, end quote. Taking initiative at a local level was a quintessential act of civic courage because it involved both forming new relations with others and creating new norms and practices in one's own community. Tocqueville reasoned that within neighborhoods, through what he calls little services rendered, obscure good offices, and a constant habit of benevolence, fellow citizens would learn to work together on a small scale to deliberate about common difficulties and thereby to come to trust one another. It's for those reasons that Tocqueville said most famously that in democratic countries, the science of association is the mother science. That science, so to speak, depended on a uniquely democratic blend of civic courage and social trust. An updated form of the idea might be found in AmeriCorps or other such organizations, or in politicians' calls for public service programs among high school students. Those programs appeal to the American ideal of serving one's fellow citizens, and our discussion today helps to unpack several of the virtues that might be developed by those involved in them. <coughs> Reconsidering trust and courage in light of earlier democratic experiences can help us grapple with our own predicament more effectively by giving us new categories of analysis, new avenues of discussion. I wouldn't pretend that the ancient Athenians or a 19th century French aristocrat can legislate for us. Our problems are ours to solve, and prior to that, they're ours to understand. Exploring the history of democratic thought 
enables us to pinpoint what's admirable in our political traditions and to reflect more deeply, more deeply on the significance of what we are already doing. And one thing we're already doing, specifically those of us in this room, is meeting one another in the setting of a public institution in order to speak and listen to one another, to educate ourselves, and perhaps to change our opinions. Among its other functions and goals, the university itself should ideally be a laboratory for the cultivation of democratic courage and trust. All of us, and particularly those who are teachers and researchers, and those who speak publicly on these questions, are in a strong position to model precisely these democratic virtues and to encourage their growth among others, including our students. Puzzling over incomprehensible texts, debating controversial ideas, testing thorny scientific questions, and so on. That kind of activity sharpens the mind in confronting its confusions, as it equally teaches that honest and potentially vulnerable conversation with others can be illuminating if only those conversations are conducted among those who are willing to speak freely, listen carefully, and revise their own views in light of new ideas and new evidence. Thank you very much. And I believe I, I should bring the mic to where we. Uh, one, one of the institutions that I think the Athenians had um, at a much higher pitch than than the United States or most modern democracies, it, didn't they have um, randomly chosen groups of citizens who had significant decision making authority? Yeah. I mean, the closest thing we have is juries in, in criminal trials, but or in in uh, civil trials. But didn't they have randomly chosen decision-making bodies for other things too, which could could have fostered um, mutual understanding in ways that are hard when you have people who are selected to be politicians? Yeah. Okay. That's that's a good point. So, yeah. In ancient Athens, you know, most of the offices, not quite all, but most of the magistracies and so forth were chosen by lot. Um, and because of the various procedural rules and so on, restrictions and requirements, um, those choices <laughs> necessarily had to involve a great proportion of the citizen body. Um, those were things like boards of magistrates uh, people who held mm, the treasurers accountable, boards of treasurers themselves, as well as a lot of service on jury courts, um, <coughs> oversight of you know, sacred land, all sorts of things like that. Um, and I would say that, yeah, that it's very important that, in particular, the council, though, the Council of 500, so every year, the council which prepared business for the assembly. Um, new measures could be raised in the assembly, but the council sort of controlled the agenda. And its members were chosen by lot. Uh, 500 citizens living together, coming together on a very regular basis, daily basis, uh, the standing government, so to speak, of the city from all regions of Attica, the territory in which Athens is located, a thousand you know, square mile regions, quite a large territory compared to the city itself. Um, and so the, di the, the sort of geographical diversity, among other things, of people who, you know, from the north, from the south, etc., was very important. And I think th that that experience, among others, yes, helped to cultivate precisely these these dispositions, but also proved to be um, 
a, an amazing, formidable education um, in how a democracy works uh, for the average citizen, you know, yeah. So I want to come back to the issue of uh, social trust because you talked a lot about social um, shared ideals, but you didn't say much about shared identity. And the work we have on social trust, which presumes you trust someone you've never met before, so it's mediated. This is what happens when you're not based on personal interactions. Uh, the best work there isn't done by uh, Greek scholars uh, or 19th century Frenchmen. There's a lot of work in psychology and economics and political science about this. And what seemed absent was the problem posed by social heterogeneity. So whether you read Robert Putnam or psychologists like Marilyn Brewer or economists like Alicina, they all come to the same conclusion, which is that social heterogeneity, in particular on ethnic, linguistic, religious, and racial lines, poses a huge challenge. And you somewhat skirted around this. And this is interesting because you should know under uh, Pericles, Athenian citizenship was limited to those born of two Athenian parents, which is a ethnic view of membership, not a political or chosen view. And if we think of uh, 19th century Frenchmen, we can think of nos ancêtres pour les Gaulois, which is an ethnic claim of membership in a republic. So it seems that it's not just about having common ideals, but there's this challenge posed by a pre-political identity. And given that social trust rests upon that, uh, it's no minor detail. Right. Yeah. No. I. I, th I think that's uh, that's a really important point. And of course, and I, I happen to know that your own work concerns this very topic. So thank you for raising that. This issue of pre-political identity. Right. Um, so you know there is a distinction, to be sure, between, for example, the heterogeneous North American democracies like the United States and a more homogeneous European democracy, you know, like Finland or something like that, where social trust is much easier to cultivate. I mean, there are various problems in a modern nation state, okay? These are just ideals that we're trying to unpack. Now, you know, Tocqueville himself, right, <coughs> was a kind of social scientist, but I, th I think he anticipated this worry um, in his famous chapter on what he calls the three races. So there, there are formidable obstacles to uh, the, the, pos the very possibility of any sort of thin civic friendship in the American experience um, because of um, the pre-political, if you like, um, identity um, of the three races, that is Native Americans, African Americans, and, uh, and European Americans. Um <coughs> So I think people acknowledge the problem even before you know, 20th century social science. Um, how do you address that problem? Um, well, I mean, you know, I would say two things. One is, is that identity necessarily pre-political? In other words, uh, the heterogeneous groups that you see, say, in Canada or the United States, um, are the people that form those groups um, necessarily more wedded in their sense of themselves to an ethnic identity than they are to a belief, for example, um, in the rule of law or in procedural justice or in the notion of democratic equality? That, it seems to me, is not at all clear. And in fact, um, one of the things that I, I happen to know, because I <coughs> naturalized as a Canadian citizen, is that those ideals are the ones that are cultivated um, in the case of new immigrants, such as myself. Um, is social trust easily achievable in a country with 350 million and a very heterogeneous, polarized population and so forth? Absolutely not. No, that is a pro it is a great problem. That's why I'm talking about it. In fact, trying to name it, trying to say what it is, and try to think through, trying to think through not some speculative solution, but to look at what we already have as a means to to develop it. So. Um, 
I, I just want to carry through this point a bit because something that I find very interesting in some of the context of my own work, also in a historical context, is ancient notions of citizenship meaning less about one's belonging to a polity in the way we mean it in the modern sense, and something more like membership of an overclass running a polity. I'm not sure it would be fair to think of classical Athens, for example, as just a homogeneous state of all citizens who all meet the categories of citizenship. Athens is a large, complicated state with a large enslaved population, a large medic population, and a citizen overclass. When we talk about harmony among Athenian citizens, that's very different than talking about harmony among Athenians in a way that isn't necessarily true of modern states. So would you say in the same sense that harmony among citizens on, again, the modern national context can be analogized to harmony among members of a smaller, discrete, and often quasi-oligarchic citizen class that you see both in ancient contexts and frankly, in de Tocqueville's America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Tocqueville himself considered the ancient Athenian democracy to be an aristocracy, right, for that reason. And uh, with some justice. I mean, so, so my argument is more about the, the ways of thinking and understanding democracy in the ancient world rather than, rather than the ways that, from our vantage point, Athenians failed to live up to their own ideals or follow them through to the degree that we have. I, I think that's true. So I, so I agree that the exclusions of outsiders, you could, say, you could say immigrants as well. There's a good analogy, in fact, um, between ancient and modern, uh, that, that these, are, these are significant problems. Um, but I don't think, for one, that the success of the Athenian democratic experiment depended on, depended on slave labor, whatever people used to say that. I don't think that's true, first. And secondly, um, <coughs> it's just what I'm trying to pick up on, anyway, is their way of theorizing the experience of democracy at a certain level of abstraction um, and asking whether their understanding, let's say, of courage, their transformation of military courage or whatever, is of any use to us. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. You, in many ways, remind me of the late Meyer Reinhold, who made a career out of seeking to approximate the virtues of the ancient world through the new discoveries in the context of the American Revolution and the founding. But, but I observed in, in Maya's work that he also came to terms with the fact that trying to harmonize the ancients and the moderns had its limits, hmm. and that those limits fell short of assimilating them. So, so I want to test you on the question of whether <laughs> you are seeking more assimilation than is accessible to us. Okay. I'll illustrate yeah. it for you. Uh, there is, of course, frequent reference in the Federalist Papers to the influence and example of the ancients, the most important of which is the representation question, yeah. when they literally proclaim that the ancients didn't know the principle of representation. Only subsequently in the same Federalist Papers to take it back and say, well, we didn't really mean that. Here's mm -hmm. what we really meant. Mm -hmm. They didn't know the alienation of the people in their collective capacity. So yes, they had magistrates, and they had a quasi-representational right. system, but their defect was the participation of the people in their collective capacity. And what we have accomplished is to abandon that. So it seems to me the thing you are most trusting on is the thing that was most explicitly rejected in the founding of the United States. And if I put it in the context of either the speeches of Diodotus and Cleon to illustrate it, I would ask, why not explain the context in which Cleon also attacked the assembly for its various weaknesses and indeed bullied it in his speech, speaking of courage, to get them to adopt the decree to extinguish the Mytilenaeans only the next day to have <coughs> Theodotus come in his courageous speech and get them to reverse the decision when the army had already been shipped off 
to accomplish the deed and then to send a second sailing to call them back. Or similar examples, but perhaps the most important of which would be the death of Socrates with regard to the question of freedom of speech, openness of inquiry, susceptibility to diverse experiences. H how do you handle those to accomplish the assimilating effect that you aim for? Well, that's a good question, or number of questions. Thank you very much. Many questions, many balls in the air. Um, mm, so let me just talk a little bit about Socrates, and then I'll come back to the Federalist. Um, it's true that you know, if you thought of free speech um, as a kind of inalienable right, um, then th that would have been abridged in ancient Athens. That wasn't the way they thought of it. And that may be a defect in itself. Um, I tend to think of the execution of Socrates um, as a failure of the Athenian democracy to live up to its own ideals. So Socrates, born in you know, 469, practicing philosophy, all the way to 399, Right, so and <coughs> Athens was the home of philosophy in his day and afterwards, the pla the the freest place um, uh, in the Greek world, the most um, the richest environment for that kind of discussion. So, in the wake of the Peloponnesian War, I think as a kind of politically motivated backlash against people who were associated with him like Critias or Alcibiades, Athens ex executed Socrates in contravention of its own ideals. It failed to live up to its own ideals. However, just thereafter and for the rest of antiquity, Athens once again assumed its place as the home of philosophy. Um, so <coughs> that's how I think of that, as a failure. Um, but not as destroying the ideals or even their practice altogether. So when you look at the Federalist, of course, the Federalist is in many ways critical of and hostile to democracy for all sorts of reasons that you've written about. <laughs> um, and that's true. I would simply say that while you know it's a complex issue, representative as opposed to participatory democracy, I would simply say that you know, as a political theorist or as a political scientist, one of our goals has to be, or one of our goals has to be to try to name and describe what we see out there. All right, and um, despite the complications. I think there is reason to believe that Americans, let's say, share quite a number of ideals and, and that those ideals, regime-specific, paradigmatic of democracy and so forth, uh, tend to be the basis of a civic identity. Um, and that's why so many theorists, again, Tocqueville, recognizing the American democracy shortcomings <coughs> and the, tr the obstacles it would face, also pointed to these same ideals when he turned to the experience of American democracy. So it's true, there's danger, you could say, in over-assimilation, but maybe there's also danger in failing to recognize uh, the persistence of certain democratic um, ideals and even virtues, we don't like to use that language, although the Federalists did, uh, to talk about the working of our democratic machine. So. Thanks. Um, I was wondering if you could say something about the extent to which you took the virtues that you were discussing to be distinctively democratic virtues, you know, or virtues of a democratic citizen as opposed to just sort of like virtues of a human being. Um, and the reason I'm asking is, I took it from the setup of the talk that the idea was, you know, Athens was a democracy, we're a democracy, so we can, and Athens was a highly functional democracy, so we can learn, and we're maybe not, <laughs> at least right now, uh, and so maybe we can learn some things 
that are distinctive about democracy. Um, but at least at times during the talk, the, the virtues you were talking about, I mean, they sounded like they'd be pretty good for people kind of anywhere. So, you know, I don't know, pick a contemporary country that's pretty <laughs> clearly not a democracy. So I don't know, North Korea, or you could pick some other country. Um, <laughs> it, 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 okay. it still seems like uh, it'd be plausible to say the society would function better if the people living there cultivated these virtues, you know, uh, courage and trust and so forth, you know, than if they, if they didn't. And so I, I wondered if you could just say a bit about the extent to which you took these particular virtues to be sort of distinctively virtues for someone who is to live in a democratic society, or to what extent are these more, you know, virtues that anywhere, more or less at any time, humans will flourish more if they have cultivated them? Okay, yeah. So I in a way, that's, that, that sounds a little bit like the Aristotelian distinction between the virtue of a citizen and the virtue of a good man or human being, all right? Um, and uh, I think that what I'm trying to get at in identifying some distinctively democratic features of these virtues is to suggest that when they're exercised in the ways I was talking about, they're paradigmatically exercised within a democratic regime. Um, now, that may be kind of a way of saying at the end of the day, and this is what, Athe this is what an Athenian would say, I believe, fully articulating the thoughts that lie beneath you know, uh, their experience, would say that um, Athenian democracy is, it would at least argue the claim that Athenian democracy um, is the best regime. That, so, th and that that regime helps to realize, um, as a matter of social practice and political practice, helps to realize virtues that, yes, would be good in other circumstances, but are unlikely to arise because they're linked specifically to these democratic practices. Uh, I guess that's how I would understand that question, yeah. Well, one quick one myself, and this is, I'm sure, something you've thought about, that many of the times, many of the passages and people you mentioned are actually sort of examples of democratic courage but are also actually criticizing the way politics is usually conducted in Athens. So you have, yeah. and I was just, I'm sure you've thought about on what basis you put more emphasis on the, on the well, they did pretty well, um, and it shows bravery that they can disagree a lot, and how much emphasis you wanna say on, well, they also made some disastrous decisions, maybe they just bumbled through, uh -huh. um, so I guess that would be my question. How, how do you uh, draw the balance between all these criticisms about uh, how to in Demosthenes or Cleon or Alcibiades or Nicias and how badly things go astray in Athenian deliberations with your conclusion? That okay, yeah, thank you. Because that, that question sort of enables me to return to Professor Allen's question about the context of Cleon and Diodotus. Um, so if you look at the Middle Aeneid debate in Thucydides, you know, there's a scholarly dispute about what it says about democracy. Of course, you'd have to say, first of all, that this is Thucydides' representation of democracy, Thucydides being probably not a great friend of democracy, even though appreciating certain strengths. Um, what I would say there is that bumbling through may actually be a sign of political strength, a sort of political resilience. So, for example, to come back to Cleon and Diodotus, Cleon's badgering of the Athenian audience stoked some angry passions and so forth uh, and led to a hot-headed decision, which in the case, you know, and again, Thucydides shows this, so to speak. In the case of Sparta, 
when a Spartan leader like Sthenelaidas stoked angry passions over Spartan cowardice and lack of manliness and so on, led to the Peloponnesian War. Whereas the Athenians, I think, because of their, you know, the intervention of Diodotus, but also a willingness to reconsider, to revise, uh, took it back and averted a something that I think would have been and is presented as being unjust, an unjust execution. So uh, actually, I take the entire episode in Book Three of Thucydides to be a sign of democratic strength, that that kind of, um <coughs> not the badgering criticism of Cleon, who said that his fellow citizens weren't manly enough and therefore had to destroy uh, the Middle Aeneans, but, but rather the, the self-criticism that enabled them to live up to their democratic ideals um, won the day and led to a better, a better outcome, I guess. So, so just to take that as a particular example of how, you know, bumbling through is actually politically maybe the best we can hope for, a sign of realism. Oh, well, <coughs> I, I said I can't legislate for us, but yeah, you want me to be tyrant. You're not alone in that respect. Um, many have asked. Um, well, I think a good suggestion is something that you know people have called on for decades now, but has never been implemented, but a kind of national service program. Um, a national service program. You could say, well, can you make it compulsory or not? Well, um, you can. I mean, because we make, say, going to high school for a while compulsory. Um, most high schools have a public service component, but you could arrange public service like AmeriCorps, say, with a view to cultivating precisely these types of dispositions across the lines of possibly pre-political identity so that people can, can talk. I guess that's at the basis of what I'm talking about in the Athenian democratic experience is that talk is a kind of intervention, almost a therapeutic type of intervention uh, that enables people to take each other's perspectives. And so um, if that's our key problem, I think that's a kind of answer. What we're already doing or just about what we're already doing. 